This episode of Real Foot Forward is sponsored by ATA, your long-term accounting partner. To learn more about the services they offer individuals and organizations, visit atacpa.net. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, the podcast where every week we explore the people, the culture, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee, just like we do every day here at our Museum and Heritage Park, Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams, your host, and I'm so excited to have Tara Dowdy, a real-life park ranger with the Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge on our podcast today. Are you from around here? Yes, I grew up in Fulton, Kentucky, and then I got married and moved across the state line to Tennessee, so now I'm in South Fulton, Tennessee. Oh, you didn't yeah. move very far. I didn't move very far at all. <laughs> but you had to change all your driver's license, yeah. and that was yeah. a pain just for those those few feet. Yeah. Um, that's a great area, by the way. It's, it is. It's really growing, and with the hotel there. Mm-hmm. They've done everything. a lot of work to the area, yeah, and refurbishing a lot of people, some new places. A lot of people don't know they have um, that at one time— like 75% of the bananas yes. in the whole world, yeah. no, in the whole United States, would go through Fulton, Kentucky. Yeah. We have our banana festival in South Fulton. I, I meant yeah. to go to that this year, and I didn't. <laughs> it's odd because you have like you know the soybean festival and the corn fest, but and then you have the banana festival at South Fulton. Right, it's all so. like it all happens like at one time, and I, I honestly had put on my calendar because I wanted to go to the banana. Um, the banana pudding contest. Oh, okay. You know, but I'm going to... Do gonna, you make banana pudding? I don't, but oh. I eat it. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I'm going to go next year. Um, and speaking of other things that I completely screwed up uh, this past year, I wanted to go see the Eagles mm-hmm. at Real Foot Lake. So yeah. we're going to talk a little bit about that Wonderful. Today. Good. So, but before we do, so you grew up around here. Did you like um, animals and conservation? And what, what was your process for ending up where you are today? It's kind of an odd story, actually. I, we uh, love odd stories oh, well, here. Well, good, because it's kind of a little different one. Uh, I always liked the outdoors. I grew up camping with my parents and my grandparents and uh, we didn't do a lot inside the house. Didn't have the Nintendos and all that. We, we did, but we didn't do that a whole lot. But I always enjoyed being outdoors. But I grew up wanting to be an art teacher, of all things. Never really thought you could have a job doing you know, your wildlife conservation type stuff. So in college, I was in my second year of doing the art education thing, and I had a friend who was also doing that. And she said uh, she wanted to work with kids for one summer, and she signed up for uh, a, to be a camp counselor at a kids' conservation and wildlife camp in Kentucky called Camp Curry. And she wanted to know if I wanted to do it with her. So I said, well, yeah, I need to pay my car off. So, yeah, I'll see if I can do this. I was working at Walmart at the time. And (laughs) so I did that for one summer. I taught hunter safety. Absolutely fell in love with working with kids, getting kids outdoors. I mean, there was we stayed in cabins where there was no electricity, no, you know, no heat, no air, no TV, anything like that. So that's kind of where I first started to really enjoy working in the outdoors, not just being outdoors, but working in the outdoors. The next summer, I worked uh, boating safety, taught kids how to drive boats and do canoes. And then after that, I changed my major, changed schools. And, wow. uh, and yeah. where did you change to? I was going to Murray State University okay. and then started going to UTM, University okay. of Tennessee at Martin. Great. And uh, had some great professors there and great classes and worked at the Real Foot Lake State Park for the next two summers. And then after I graduated, it was almost like the stars aligned. Every, I'm very blessed and very lucky. Uh, as soon as I graduated college, the position at the National Wildlife Refuge came open. So able to work out really well. And so what does the National Wildlife Refuge, what's its purpose? What does it do? What is the role of that organization? It is to provide habitat for migratory waterfowl. And there are many people in our local area that get it mixed up with the Real Foot Lake State Park because I worked there too. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of, uh, when I go to the schools and do programs, they think I work at the state park. And the state park is the one where they have the owls and the eagles that were rescued. That is right. They They rehabilitate a lot of your birds of prey, and they have a snake room, and they have some really cool things outside to go see. And Boyette is across the street. Exactly. Yeah. And when most people go to Real Foot Lake, they think, well, I'm going to go to the state park and visit them and then go eat fish somewhere, whether it's right. Boyettes or Blue Pink or Lakeview or wherever. Now, I was the opposite. So when we first moved here, we wanted to go see Real Foot Lake, mm-hmm. and we ended up at your place yes, first because yeah, right. we just turned right, yeah. and it's be- beautiful, very well done. And we thought yeah. that was was it. So. Yeah, well, I didn't realize you came to us first. So that makes me feel good. Yeah, yeah, you you, <laughs> you got me first. Good, so yeah, good it, was, deal. it was great. So continue. So the state park, they're they're there 
specifically for preserving public lands and providing uh, good experiences to visitors. Whereas the National Wildlife Refuge, we do want people to come to the refuge, but our main priority, our main goal, our mission is to provide habitat for wildlife, particularly for waterfowl. And so talk a little bit about waterfowl. Most, A lot of people listening don't realize that there are three waterways or three, yeah. whatever you call it. Yeah. Educate us, yeah. teach us about the migratory patterns and how we're involved in that. So there's four. Four. Four okay. flyways in North America, and those are routes that birds take during migration. So on the West Coast, you have the Pacific Flyway, and then centrally located in North America is the Central Flyway, We have the Mississippi Flyway right here where we are located. And then on the East Coast, we have the Atlantic Flyway. And those are all routes that birds travel down as they're migrating. Um, Of course, when they're migrating, they're going to be everywhere, but they're going to be more densely populated in those flyways. So where we are located, we're in the very, I mean, very center of the Mississippi Flyway. So, for example, um, you have any given time of the year at Real Foot, you can see mallards and you can see wood ducks. But during migration season, you can see, this is just as far as waterfowl goes, you see your mallards and you still see your wood ducks, but you also see things like pintails and gadwalls and widgeons and canvasback and lesser scop and ringnecks and northern shovelers and all sorts of different types of waterfowl. What's because the they're, rarest ooh. one you've seen? Have you seen one where you're like... There it is. I've been searching for that. Not necessarily waterfowl-wise, but we have seen several just odd birds come through here. We mm-hmm. saw a white-faced ibis earlier in the year, which we I think typically is on the Atlantic flyway. But I don't know what happened. They get blown off. Of course, migration is very hard on a lot of birds. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how he ended up in the Mississippi flyway, but we saw one of those. And we've seen just a regular white ibis, which is a different type of bird as well. Um, roseated spoonbills, those are very rare to see here. I, actually, I didn't see it. There was word that one was in the area. But uh, we have seen some rare birds in our area, but not necessarily Waterfowl, I don't guess. I haven't seen one. I'll okay. say that. Okay. And then do people contact you when they, you know, when they get blown off course and there's one laying in their front yard? Yeah, we do get some phone calls. Not not very many, but when that white face ibis came in, uh, someone had told us about that and we went to go see it. Um, and then, of course, we called the Tennessee Ornithological Society members that we know and they came to see it and they reported it and stuff. So, yeah, we, we do get some odd phone calls. And so... Uh, Talk a little bit more about the relationship between this area and real foot and the ducks. I think it's at that whole area is a real big mm-hmm. part of our history and, and our present, obviously. Yeah, they call it a sportsman's paradise. So there's a lot of duck hunting that goes on there, So which brings a lot of hunters in. Um, I would like to say many people think that if since we work at a National Wildlife Refuge that we're against hunters, and we are not at all. Um, because if you are 16 and older and you are going to waterfowl hunt, you have to buy what's called the federal duck stamp, and that costs twenty five dollars, and that provides money for purchasing land for breeding areas for them. And actually, the junior duck stamp contest, um, I've been trying to push that a little bit, getting kids interested in the federal duck stamp and junior duck stamp program. But the federal duck stamp program, um, it I think it has provided over nine hundred and fifty million dollars uh, to provide land for waterfowl, which is really good. Um, so we do like, you know, we do have, enjoy the hunters come into our area, but we don't have waterfowl hunting on the National Wildlife Refuge. It's specifically for their protection there. Um, so yeah. And so what, what exactly is your, uh, title? I'm a refuge ranger, refuge education ranger. and volunteer coordinator. Okay. Um, so kind of going back to explaining the differences between the park yeah. and the refuge, because it, it does get very confusing, because I do a lot of the same things that the, that the state park does. So the state park does a lot of programs. Everybody there can do environmental education. With the National Wildlife Refuges, I'm the sole person, the only person that does programs for our for Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge, as well as other refuges within our area. So Real Foot National Wildlife Refuge is actually part of a group of refuges. We are the West Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Okay. So I do environmental education for uh, O'Brien County, Dyer County, Haywood County, Lauderdale County, Tipton County. So I go a lot. I go and see a lot of different schools and do a lot of different programs there, but I'm the only person that does that. So that's kind of the focus on environmental education. There's one of me at the National Wildlife Refuge, but there's a lot in other places. Yeah, so you're really the federal... Um, arm. I mean, you're the one for the nation um, here. Is that right? Uh, I w- and they're uh. and they're Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we're the West Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge okay. Complex. So in our West Tennessee, I'm kind of the face of the West Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge and Complex. And you wear like professional looking sheriff looking clothes. So 
<laughs> so you must be important. <laughs> well, I get asked if I'm a cop a lot. So. Yeah, see, yeah, that's <laughs> exactly know, right. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I told people you were my security guard. And I think funny. they were believing me for a second. <laughs> um, so what? Um, let's talk a little bit about the Eagles. Because okay. that because we're famous for the Eagles, we are. Yeah. Um, not the not the group, not the musical group, mm-hmm. but the birds. So talk a little bit about Eagles. So we have Eagle tours in our area, January and February. We offer them at the National Wildlife Refuge Wednesday through Saturday. There's an eight tour, eight o'clock tour, and a twelve o'clock tour. Um, and every year is a little bit different. Some years we see, I have seen up to ninety four eagles on one two and a half hour tour. And so what's because t- I didn't get that's the thing. I'm doing a tour this year. I didn't Good. do it last year. So. Yeah. Talk me through what does a tour consist of? Well, you get we have a van. We don't have a big bus at the National Wildlife Refuge. We have a van, so we take private tours, uh, five people and a fewer. So you're with your own family. You're not with anybody else, um, which is – there's pros and cons to that both. But you can – if you need to hurry up and get back because you need to use the restroom, we can do that. Or if you want to go out longer and stay longer to take pictures of all sorts of different types of birds, we can stay out longer. Um, so we would leave from the National Wildlife Refuge uh, Visitor Center, and we drive to Grassy Island, which and what is, kind of time first? How, like oh, what time does it start? 8 o'clock in the morning. 8 o'clock. you got to be mm-hmm. there. 8 o'clock. Yep. Early start. Do if you, you have take coffee? take the morning tour, we do have coffee. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can give you coffee. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so we have an 8 a.m. tour, and then we have a 12 p.m. tour. Okay. So we have two tours throughout the day. They last anywhere from two to three hours, mostly, okay. depending on how much we see. So I show up. It's 8 o'clock. You give me mm-hmm. coffee. What happens next? <laughs> then we get into the van. I've already got it preheated for you there. Nice. Preheated. That sounded like an oven. <laughs> We've got it warmed up for you. <laughs> um, and then we would leave from the visitor center, and we go to Grassy Island, which is our bottomland hardwood forested area, and it's our wildlife drive. So we drive through some – we wind down some roads. There's trees on both sides of you, and it's flooded on one side. And you see mallards uh, in the, the flooded timber, and they're flying up, and you might see a blue heron fly off. Uh, at the very end of the road, which that road is about three miles. At the very And is that the one that there's – a a, a, towards the end, there's a deck that, yes. or a pier yes. that goes out over the so water. So it, it dead ends, and there's a viewing tower at the very end. And we, it's a long pier, and then it goes up to a viewing tower. Yeah. So we go out to, to the viewing tower, and we take our scopes and our binoculars and our camera, and we look to see if there's eagles out on the trees, and we look for different types of ducks that are out there. Um, you might see geese flying over. So you can see quite a bit out there. Um, then we leave. We go back down the same road, and we head up to the northern portion of the lake, uh, the Long Point unit. So the National Wildlife Refuge is broken up into two different units. You have Grassy Island and you have Long Point. There's not a lot of management that goes on at Grassy Island, kind of manages itself. But at Long Point, that's where we have our, uh, we plant row crops for the ducks. We plant corn for them and we have moist soil um, units, which is natural vegetation that we grow for them. So when we go to Long Point, uh, there's another viewing tower there and you can see hundreds if not thousands of ducks and thousands of geese that are out there feeding uh, either on the corn or the moist soil and uh, moist soil impoundments and anywhere where you see ducks and geese you see eagles because that's mm. what they like to eat that's why the eagles are coming down this this direction is because they're following their food source we have resident eagles that are here all year long uh, but we do have the migratory ones that come down from the great lake states canada alaska several different places and they're they're following their food source so you like i said anywhere you see ducks and eagles ducks and geese, you're going to see eagles there. And so uh, do you actually get to see them feed or they feed at night or how does that work? Well, yeah. sometimes you get to see them eating. That's um, what I many people, see. when they're on an eagle tour, they like to look in the trees. They like to look to see if the eagles are flying. But many of them will be down on the ground eating a dead duck mm. um, that may have been injured by a waterfowl hunter across the across our okay. boundary. Okay. So that's interesting to see them, to see what they're eating. Actually, I saw one yesterday, not on the eagle tour, but I saw one yesterday eating a, a dead deer on the side of the road. So they can kind of act like vultures in a way, too. They love to eat ducks and they love to eat fish, but they will eat other things on the side of the road, too. Now, you have to have capacity issues if you only have one van and one of you, and you can only do... So do you sign up? Do people sign up in advance? Yes. Or? Yeah. Um, the majority of our days are full in January, but we have some some slots left in February. But the peak season is the very end of January, very beginning of February. That's okay. when you're going to see the most ducks, most geese, and most eagles. And where do you sign up? You call the National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. Uh, the number is 731-538-2481. Okay. And you just say when, you know, you uh, – Luke, remind me to do that. I got to I gotta get <laughs> signed up for that this year. Um and then, um, what are some of the um, what are the, some of the things? I'm curious because you have to me a fascinating job. So, mm-hmm. what is? I know it changes throughout the year, but what is a, the, a day like oh. for you? 
Well, like you said, everything is depends on the time of the year. Every day is completely different, and that's why I absolutely love my job. I literally have my dream job, and it's so exciting because there will be days that I come in, and there are days you, you have office work, and you have to do things in the office, but normally those are fun things like developing programs for an upcoming school you're going to see that's already seen all of your other programs. You have to come up with something new. Uh, so I may be in the office doing work. I may be leading a canoe trip on the National Wildlife Refuge, which is always really fun. So, um, so is so that's another. So, so do you rent canoes? We don't rent them. You have to bring your own canoe. We have canoes that you can use. Uh, oh. all, our tours are free, so you can just. We have eight canoes, and they're three seater canoes, that's so crazy. we can take you out. I know. So it's I awesome. just have to call and sign up. I'm yep. doing that this year. We do have guided uh, well, every canoe trip that we have is a guided canoe trip and we have set dates for those typically okay. i do i'm the one that leads them uh, i'll lead them one saturday a month throughout the spring and the summer uh, and that's all dependent on uh, well several different factors you have to have at least eight or more to sign up typically we have a lot of people sign up so we're going out but if it's a slow if we only have two people go to, to sign up then we don't typically i mean i am very up. popular so i could probably find eight friends <laughs> yeah six yeah. friends my wife and i need to find six we friends. could probably take you out by yourself too you'd be a special guest <laughs> oh thank you so much that is nice of you no i got to do that too because you know in dc they rent you know they have huge amounts of you know places where you can rent a kayak yeah. or a canoe and so mm-hmm. but here i when i was at real felt like i couldn't find a place where i could just rent a kayak or a canoe yeah and check it out i think there's one place that you can actually rent kayaks and that may be at blue bank at blue bank still blue do bank that. Resort. Uh, yeah, the state park has kayaks and canoes. I don't believe they rent them out either. I could be wrong about that. But ours, you know, you can just take it out with the with the guide, and I can. But but we don't rent them out at the national. It's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting that um, you know the area has been catering to hunters for so long and bird watchers, and you know that it's really. Um, not yet really at big capacity for tour and travel yet. So I think just based on things I've talked to people about, Mm -hmm. that's kind of where they're headed is, you know, having places where people can, you know, rent them and put in and, and, but, but real foot lakes also different than a lot of other lakes in that there, it's not like, you know, a moving body of water and there are stumps everywhere. There are stumps everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And when, if the water level is down a little bit lower, because the only thing that can, that adds water to real foot lake really is rainfall. So if you don't have a lot of rain, rainfall, then you get closer and closer to those stumps if you're in a boat <laughs> yeah. or a canoe or a kayak or whatever you're so in. What, so what, um, obviously you have a job that you probably wouldn't be able to do as well in a, in a, uh, in an urban environment. Um, what are the benefits to you personally of living in such a cool area as this? There's just so much to see. There really is. It's a, you see a lot of unique, different habitat types and for the, it's interesting that you said that it wouldn't be um, very big in an urban area. There are urban refuges, and mm. those are they have a lot of people that come to those National Wildlife Refuges because if you live in an urban area, you don't have very many places where you can go enjoy the outdoors. And so to have mm. those urban refuges are really good. But we do have people – we have people come from Memphis that take field trips to our refuge just to – just to get outdoors. I had a third grader one time. Uh, we were collecting macroinvertebrates. We were taking dip nets, and we were dicking, dipping um, na- the you know, little bugs, the mm-hmm. macroinvertebrates, out of there and, and identifying those and talking about water quality. And this one kid said, and he was in third grade, he said, I've never played in mud before. Oh, wow. I thought, oh my word. Yeah. Well, get your hands in that mud. <laughs> get yeah, your hands dirty. Right. So it's – it's just a nice place where you can enjoy the outdoors, get dirty, and not worry about having to go somewhere and looking all nice and cleaned up afterward. And if somebody's listening to this who's never been to this area, um, what I think is a perfect uh, weekend experience is to come there and play around at Real Foot Lake and mm-hmm. look for the eagles and then come here to Discovery Park yes. because we have the aquarium with all the fish in it, and we have the um, earthquake simulator, yep. which actually uh, recreates how Real Foot Lake was formed um, in the first place. And That's so right. it, you, it's, a, it's a great um, educational but yet really fun way to experience this area. Um, yeah. And then as you're just driving around in this area, it's really beautiful everywhere you go. You mm-hmm. know, there are um, – Hawks everywhere, which, by the way, you're the perfect person for me to ask this Uh-oh. question. Why are there so many hawks that have been murdered on the side of the road oh, around here? They get hit by vehicles. Um, you know, when they're hunting, they they like transition areas, like wooded areas, and then open areas, so they can hunt. So they're standing in the trees or the 
telephone poles, power lines, and they're looking for their food source on the other side of the road. And they see it, and, and they, they don't look zo- both ways before they, they, they cross don't look the both street. ways. That's right. Yeah, they they zone in on their prey, and then they swoop down. It happens to a lot of owls too. That's how the park actually gets a lot of their injured. Mm birds there so they get hit by vehicles unfortunately yeah we actually have an owl here today at discovery Park. that's what i hear yeah, yeah. so that's i'll have to I ask them if it has like a little um a little graduation cap on it but they said it didn't <laughs> yeah. um so i'm definitely gonna go to check that out um but then also personally i know you have a kid um mm-hmm. do you do you uh see benefits in raising your kid in a in an area like this oh yeah i've got two boys oh two boys okay. two boys that are very much boys okay good <laughs> so good. they like being outdoors they love to fish they love to hunt Actually, my uh, both of my boys have killed a turkey and a deer already. And oh, what? how old they, are they? They are seven and nine. Okay, and great. And so they, they, my oldest one, my nine-year-old, he can actually, he shoots his own doves and he... He cleans them and he puts them in bags of salt water all by itself. So oh, it's wow. they love this area. They love real foot like they love coming to work with mom every once in a while. We have a junior ranger program in the summertime where we teach kids how to shoot bows and arrows. And uh, the National Wild Turkey Federation they come in and they bring an inflatable BB gun range and uh, we canoe with them. There's all sorts of different things that we do. So they think mom's job's pretty cool. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> and you actually did uh, you did some bow and arrow uh, training here at Discovery Park this past summer, I did, yeah. which was a lot of fun. I think yeah. we're going to do that again this coming up summer so that was a very good program that was really neat that yeah you it was that. fun i think um i think it's great i think a lot of uh, people would uh, take advantage of it yeah um, do y'all do that kind of thing um at real foot or we do and i, I are you talking about the camp or just teaching, the archery teaching archery yeah we do that like at that. the refuge we also go to I'll, i will go to schools and do that so um the one school that i've really got partnered up with was the Union City Elementary School. There were hundreds of kids that I taught archery to. Uh, we have a, a women's archery thing that we can do in the fall that I'm starting to get cranked up a little bit. Um, we've had some homeschool students is that like, come with um, that too. Is that like wine and paint kind of thing? No, do do we don't have wine. And, <laughs> and archery and wine. And the paint, yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> it's really interesting though to see how well women are very good at archery and even if they've never done it before, mm-hmm. they I think they surprise themselves. When I go to the schools, which I hope none of the boys listen to this that go to Union City Elementary, but the girls outshot the boys. I mean, huh, it was really interesting. It's how, a sport. Do yeah. they have like do they have like leagues and things in, in this They're, area? Well, they have the National Archery in the Schools program, and that's who I was trained under for teaching archery. But I think it's um, it's nationally known, but in this area, I don't think there's a lot of that going on in the schools right now. But hopefully we'll get some interest in it, and they can start picking that up in the local schools. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Yeah, this well, has thank been you for fun. We've been me. trying to we've been trying to make this happen for a long time, so I'm glad it finally worked out. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. And now Andrew Gibson is taking us behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America to see what we may be able to discover today. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America, and today I'm with Carl. Ulrich, who is a docent here, um, who last time he was on the episode or on on the podcast, talked about uh, firehouses and the kind of the history behind the firehouses. Uh, So continuing that theme, he's going to talk to us more and share some very interesting stories. Uh, So Carl, uh, take it away. Well, I thought I would discuss, uh, pertaining to the history of the fire service, a little bit about how one would call 911 before anybody had gotten around to inventing the telephone. Uh, obviously, 911 is also a modern invention, but how would you contact the fire department before before telephone was invented? So the obvious initial solution was to send a runner to the fire station, wherever the closest one happened to be. And that has uh, limited utility because in a large city where you have multiple fire stations, how do you know, how do you communicate with the other stations that, hey, this fire is more than we can handle, we need more help. So in the 1840s and 50s, when... Uh, the telegraph was being invented, someone started thinking along the lines of, hey, this might not be a bad idea. We could probably adapt this technology to make a fire alarm system to communicate through a municipality. Uh, The first person to do that successfully was a guy named Dr. William Channing, who was an itinerant dentist. Um, And the technology was so new that anybody who was a hobbyist could get involved in in that. And so he did. And he invented the first practical system, and that was installed in Boston, Massachusetts in 1851. And so he had a telegraph apparatus that that was placed on various street corners 
in the city, and the residents would go and they would pull the alarm hook to activate it, and that would send a telegraph signal to the fire stations and alert them to which box that was. So the boxes were coded. Each one had a unique number, and so the firefighters would look at their map and say, well, that's box number one, and that's at the intersection of you know, fill-in-the-blank. And so they would know where to respond. So along came a guy named John Nelson Gamewell, and he also was I was probably more of an entrepreneur than an inventor, and he saw this idea and said, hey, this is fantastic. I'm going to get rich off of this deal. So he wound up buying the rights to that system from Channing, and his name uh, and the company that bears his name became synonymous with fire alarm systems. Uh, that company is actually still around today. So he... Not only he made some improvements to the system, but like a lot of companies, uh, became so powerful that when people would come along and make improvements to this technology, rather than try to compete against him, they would just sell out to him. And so his empire got bigger and bigger. So we don't see a lot of these fire alarm boxes in our area in, uh, in the southern states. It's more of a or more commonly found today in New England and perhaps on the West Coast, and they're less common today than they, they used to be. So the, the way these things work, obviously there's one on every street corner or approximately every street corner, and sometimes on major buildings or factories, and each box has its own unique number, and that tells the firefighters which map or where on the map they need to go to. And so it would actually, the uses a clockwork mechanism initially weight-driven, but then later on spring-wound, an actual clockwork. Uh, and so when you pull the hook to activate that alarm, it would tap out the code of whatever number corresponded to that box. So if you had box 11, that's a 1 and a 1. So it sound in the firehouse something like a boxing ring gong. And there would be a, rent, there would be a bell in every room or, or close enough to every room in a firehouse where everybody could hear that. So... The, the boxes would be numbered sequentially, although, and you could do a zero, so you could have a box 10. It would be a one gong followed by 10 gongs. Well, that's not very practical because it takes a long time to tap out 10 gongs. You could actually tap out a one, 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 one faster than you could a one zero or a one ten in this, that case. And so very often the box numbers aren't pure, you know, truly sequential because they would leave out all the high digits just to save time. Uh, so in a city where you had multiple fire stations, you ha that next begs the question of how do you know who goes to this fire? You can't all go to one fire because you have to continue coverage throughout the city. So every station had what were called run cards in a file that somebody was assigned to keep track of. And when a gong would sound, they would count the alarms, count, count the count the strikes, figure out which box that was, and they go to the run card. It would That run card would show the address of that box, the box location, and it would tell which engine companies, ladder companies, chief officers, uh, and rescue companies might be responding to that when that alarm sounded. And so a typical response would be two or three engines and a ladder truck plus a fire chief for a typical fire. So let's assume that they respond to that fire, they get there, and the chief says, yeah, this is more than we can handle with the assignment that we have here. I need more help. He would then go or have somebody go back to that box and, and tap out on a telegraph key that was located inside that box twice to indicate this is a second alarm and then pull the hook again. So when that number came back through the alarm office and the firehouses would say, hey, this is a second alarm at this location. So then they'd go back to their run cards and see, well, who is the second on the second alarm assignment? So there may be an additional three engines and two ladders and an additional chief officer on a second alarm and so on, all the way up to fifth alarm. And there are a few communities that did alarm systems or, or – uh, methods of operation of the alarm systems where they would have more than five, five alarms, but that's kind of unusual. Typically, you would say a fifth alarm or perhaps a fifth and greater, meaning it was everybody was coming to that fire. So another aspect of that is when you have multiple alarms and everybody's going to this fire, that's going to leave a pretty good swath of the city uncovered in a larger geographical area. And so 
there would be additional move up assignments. So you might not be responding to a fire on a second alarm or a third alarm, but you might have to move to a different station to cover that territory in case other fires happened. And in a big city where you were worried about conflagrations, that did happen. So fire brands would, would be uh, lifted up by the heat column in the smoke, and the wind would carry it somewhere f- several blocks away and start a new fire on the rooftops. So you, had, you couldn't eliminate your fire coverage uh, by putting everybody on one fire. You had to have people scattered throughout that area. So my mom makes this dish called Five Alarm Chili. Uh, so is that where we get the name for that from? It is. So we kind of use that at, to send, um, to indicate something that's exceptionally hot. So Five Alarm ch- Chili should be pretty hot. So we have emergency phones here at the park, which I don't advise people pulling them. Um, but we do have something that you you can uh, kind of get your hands on. Uh, and Carl, can you can you tell us about that? Yes. And in front of our firehouse, we do have one of these game well alarm boxes. It's a 1951 series three fold master box is the technical name for that. And uh, anyway, it is not actually hooked up to the alarm system. And so it is something that our guests are invited to come and experience. So you can pull that hook and sound that alarm without actually getting a citation for turning in a false alarm. You guys heard it here from Carl. Thank you all for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America, where we pride ourselves in those hands-on experiences, just like the fire alarm. And we hope to see you here real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.